we're always running out of time, so welcome. Wow, a lot of people not going to Tim Bird. Sorry that you miss him. I miss him too, but it's great that you're here. I want to talk a little bit of one of my favorite tools I'm using now really for decades in Linux and also for embedded things and picked up a few special things. Uh, what Edge S-Trace is doing seriously almost every day for me in both software development and also in the lab work, working with real hardware. Um, who has never used S-Trace before? Okay, not too many. So. Um, I would have said, um, this is mostly command line based. I will give a lot of examples. The slides are only giving you some key points what you should read up in the uh, main pages uh, if you're interested in. Um, after the talk, I will save my history about the commands and also put that, upload that uh, to, to the conference page. And also the slides are a little bit updated in the meantime, but they don't have any serious content. So it's just giving examples and ideas and so a little bit outline what it is, uh, very few sentences to me, and then I just want to show where you find the documentation and the ideas about S-Trace, and then giving some examples about how you use S-Trace at all, what it is all about, and how you get the output, how you shape the output, uh, get more or less information, and making it useful for whatever you want to do. Give, giving examples about fi filtering system calls that you select on what you're really interested in, and <coughs> then um, so uh, it's, should I go closer to the microphone that you can lower it a little bit, but I always see a small echo and uh, it, I thought it's quite interesting to see, because I'm using that a lot, what you can do with timestamps, timing, and what you can get from your examples, for example, from any data sources or from your computer. And if time is enough, um, there's a small example how you can replay things and why you want to do that maybe. <laughs> So about me, very quick, I did very first open source things already in school when we didn't know that term because there have been two high schools in a row in one street and so we built hardware and software and handed it over to the other two high schools and was playing around when I came to university. The first thing I got as a student as my first job in computer service department, oh, there is this real Mac tape, so these large things which you see in old FBI movies. Um, there's some software that was then uh, the typesetting system LaTeX for ty typography, doing uh, typesetting math and things. That is also open source before that was a term because Donald Knut all put it in the uh, open source public domain, whatever, with the only uh, thing you have to pass very extensive tests that you can call it tech if your binary runs there and if you, it's not passing the tech, you should fix that. And yeah, then I was working early with VMS for the tech systems. Later, we got the first Unix machine in university, hooray. But that was all closed in Germany. Uh, the problem was uh, we didn't get um, Unix source license and things. It's really big iron. And so whenever something did not work and you wanted to extend it, sorry, you lost until then in the early 90s when really source licenses in the 18th uh, lawsuit uh, went apart and the first free BSD, BSD 386 at that time, sources came apart and then I bought an Intel machine again. I, I was playing with Intel machines and even before we did assembler on the 6502 in the Commodore and did in, uh, assembler on the first 8088 IBM PC for hardware stuff. But it was always crappy architecture and I hated it. And so I liked other architecture way more because they are more and clean. But then I had to buy my PC because it was an opportunity running Linux, which I started already in 92, so more than 30 years ago. And uh, then I bought a graphics card, which was supposed to be supported. And I noticed, oh, it's not supported at all. So I stepped into writing support and graphics driver for my graphics card and did it a bit longer and was core maintainer of the S3 chips for a while in the X386 project. 2001, I finally left after a wonderful time at university and earned some money and was working in my hometown in Tübingen for 13 years altogether giving yeah, Linux support to customers, whatever they want to have, uh, getting in, in the R&D environment of automotive mostly. And until I got uh, had a, a contract for two years from Bosch SensorTech, just writing a driver for YouTube, which is upcoming, and that took a little longer. I'm still working on that project and still working on those drivers. Hardware changed a lot, drivers changed a lot. 
and 2013, after two years of ex external development, I joined Bosch Sensor Tech for doing consumer electronics and a project which will be announced the next years. Let's see. And Bosch Sensor Tech is actually a subsidiary of Bosch Automotive, and they are doing all the consumer electronic sensors, so the uh, acceleration, gyro, magnetometer, whatever, uh, gas sensors which you have in your smartphones and all these things. It's all everything but automotive. So, about documentation for that all. Um, the most important documentation for me, being a very old Unix guy, uh, is still man pages. And yes, you have to read the man page to get all the options, command line options, how they work. I always look it up because some of them I never can remember. There are new command line options from time to time. It's an active development, that's great. Um, in the lower part, I found some nice talks from Dimitri Levin. Is author or one of them. So he's the guy always giving talks at Fostem in Brussels and he's very exciting to listen to and what are the new things and I had a lot of bits and bits learned from him and typically always forgotten very fast because if I don't use it, it's not in my back brain and it doesn't work out. So it's very basic what I do but even that ba very basic features, um, S-Trace is very cool and there are more options which you find in there mostly the man page or also in the talks from Dimitri. Um, S-Trace is all um, set up uh, or is using the P-Trace system call. This is what the Linux kernel and also other Unix things um, offer as a debugging port that uh, some debugger can control some other process that's process tracing. And with that thing you can stop a process, single step it, make breakpoints and all these things. And S-Trace also uses it. S-Trace stands for system call trace. So it's interfering in the call from your program, from user level to system the kernel. This is the POSIX API. So you see all the POSIX calls, uh, how you open a file, read a file, do these things, how you do network connections, always on the POSIX kernel level. And this is why um, what we will see in a minute uh, from the S-Trace output, this is always kernel calls. And if you don't understand, uh, it will re really will output you are doing right with these parameters. And if you don't understand a parameter or want to know the exact details of those calls, you always can read the manual. And Unix manuals are, in, are uh, intersected in sections. And section two are the system calls. That's the POSIX API. So whenever you see something in that thing, there must be a man section two, whatever. Uh, most of them you can just do man whatever, but if you do that with write, you get in section one because there's also a command line, uh, command line, command write. So if you do man write, you get section one. So always uh, man. And this is not what you're looking for. Then you can write to some other users because it's section one. So if you really want to understand what write does, then you get this information that says write has a parameter file descriptor, blah, blah, blah. Who never was programming or reading any line of C code? No hand up, that's great. Yeah, the question is just because uh, yeah, the kernel interface, the POSIX kernel thing, this is C, plain C interface. And so you just have to get a little bit of an idea what write might do and what the parameters are all about. If not, there are the man pages. Documentation, ah, and just a hint, on the web page for this talk, there will be there are not only the slides which will update after the talk, uh, but also two older articles from 2014 and 2015, little longer papers to read, getting more ideas how you can do system tracing, and also a long article how you can use S-Trace for analyzing the bash, really the command line, and with quoting and globbing and wildcards and things like that. Okay. Oh. How to start and use S-Trace? S-Trace has two modes. You can say S-Trace, some program, and it will output things. Um, and you can do S-Trace-P, some process, and you can attach to some process. I would use both now just for giving a lot of examples. Um, so if the thing is running, sometimes your start of your database takes long and s will do a lot of tracing and outputs and can slow down your processes, then maybe it's good or it's already running, the SSH daemon is always running in your system and now you want to trace the next login, what's going on and things, then the second part is good. If you want to have all the important things, uh, then you can s, s just start your command. 
The first very important option, which I have here on the slide, and we'll use that a lot, is dash F, follow all childs. So typically, S-Trace will only trace this single command or this single process you're specifying. And if that's going a fork and exec and doing new child processes, it's not being traced automatically. You have to say dash F, follow all those things. For the second example, it's important because time is the command which will be S traced. And if I only do S trace without a dash F, it will only trace time. And time will then exec as a child echo because it wants, the time wants to figure out when echo is done and say, yeah, this took a few milliseconds. And if you don't have the dash F, you don't see the echo. But now let's, if, ah, okay. And the first example, no, I do not see my task list. That's bad. Why can't I see to which window I'm switching to? I don't know. Somehow that's gone. So it's a little bit tricky getting the right window, please. Get that. So that's second number the two, and this is number three. That's what I well, maybe I have to close that. Okay. Now here's a very small shell which I can use as side testing thing. So this bash has process ID 11455. And now I can do uh, the very first example, which I always do, hey, is S-Trace installed at all? Then I do, it, for example, S-Trace PWD. Unfortunately, most of the Linux distributions don't install S-Trace by default. And you will only notice when it's a little bit late and you have a big problem, you want to use that wonderful tool and notice oh, it's not installed. So if you have not installed it, do it now. And so here you get a lot of code now from S-Trace. It starts with exec, VE, in the, in the old was the fork and exec thing, now it's virtual environment, whatever Linux thing. You see which path it is and how the command was called and a lot of other things. And I'll, whenever you look on, into that and you have no real clue what it's all going about, just skip it and look for the important key points. We'll focus on a few of these things. But you can see it's opening libc, you get all the file paths which are loaded and which are necessary to start up a file at all. The very first one is the system loader cache and you can see how it's reading the shared library and blah, 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 blah. Um, here, the only thing I would be interested in, what is get um, PWD, uh, print working directory doing? <coughs> you see it's uh, uh, giving a kernel call, get current working directory. And this already returns some magic string. And it says, ah, this has been 32 bytes. If you're not clear what exactly is doing, then there are the man pages. And hope, ah, oh, this is man page on section three. And if it's really good, yeah. Section three is the C library, just directly calling the kernel call. That it should be almost identical. And it says, yeah, this is the get current working directory, you have a buffer, you can you have to specify how much bytes are the buffer, how big is the buffer space that it's not doing override and memory leaks and uh, uh, buffer overflow attacks and it will return, if you read the text, how many char characters are returned back. So this is all how it's working with S-Trace, but yeah, just looking, so, oh no, so, so it said uh, we have a buffer of four kilobyte, feel free to write up to four kilobyte of path and the kernel then returned with, uh, now this string is 32 bytes long. If it would be larger than the 4K, it's not writing everything and you see it at least in the return value. And the second important thing, what now the most of the talk is about, then it writes to file descriptor number one, standard output, exactly that string which you got from the kernel with a nice line ending that you see it in your prompt is on the next page. Um, the bright writes exactly thus 32 bytes. I'm wondering how that works with the backslash n. If, if this has been 32 bytes and this should be 33 then. Interesting. Oh, the cat cu current working directly maybe counts the zero byte. I, have to, I want to know that now. So the full string is 31 bytes, so the get current working return code also counts the zero byte, which it all also has written into the buffer space. 
And here um, you on only count the number of characters which you really want to have been written because zero bytes don't count for write. It's just a buffer. Write this binary data with or without zero bytes. And then you, here you see that the string is coming out of on the console. I will show in a few minutes because that's quite annoying that uh, now Exactly, it's getting called in the kernel. The kernel does that output. This is why the string shows up here. And then when it comes back from the kernel, uh, S-trace takes a second, it catches calling the kernel thing and it, it catches again uh, in when the kernel returns. And only then it can say, okay, now I'm back from kernel and the kernel said, I wrote 32 bytes for you. So if the disk is full, that could be less or whatever. So this, but this is how it's looking all alike and you can watch all those system calls and can do a lot of nice things with that. That should be, yes, that's my browser again, so that should be those three pages. Um, so calling it directly is option one. Uh, just do a uh, um, Well, it's even less sophisticated because it's not, uh, it doesn't have to do a kernel call. It's just, it's really write the string to the console and it's always a little bit garbled. Um, this is why typically I do, yeah, just, I know what the echo thing is doing. I, uh, so write it to def, the regular output from echo to def null and uh, um, S-trace always outputs to standard error of file descriptor 2. This is why I can throw away the standard output and still get the S-trace output on the console. And then it's a bit easier readable. It's all in one line that, uh, please write the further character. Nice. If I now want to see how how long this takes, and I very often type, type time in, in, in front of commands, how long does the compile work? How long does this and that work? How long does the echo work? Oh, that's never tried it before. It's quite fast. And time also outputs on standard error because, yeah, that's important information you want to have a console even if you throw away the hello greeting. And if I do an S-trace now, <coughs> and I look what's really output, then it's a top correct and some timing. And then if you analyze that, you see that this is only the output of the time command. And so 83% um, blah, 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 whatever. And it outputs a lot of single characters, don't ask me. And this is because it only traces time. And if I want to see the echo thing, which is more interesting to me, you have to say, follow those child processes, please. And if I do that and scroll up a little bit, then first we should see somewhere that it really do, does exec, blah, blah, blah. So this first is all time. And you could, now, since it's more than one process, it shows me the process IDs up to the somewhere the fork and exec. You can read that in the first paper. Um, it's execing whatever process ID that should be saying, ah, oh, the, the first process is six, something 6.3, and somewhere there's a cl the clone of, of, it was in the old time, it was fork process, now it's called clone, and the clone says, oh, the, this is the child process, and now, it, since it's now tracing two processes, it starts um, attributing every line to this is process this, this is process that. And yeah, the, the process blah, 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 6.4 is going to do the echo command, and the echo command finally somewhere are here. That's right. Hello, Brock. Nice. Um, I can do the same uh, now with detached process. And this is what I want to show. Oops. That way. So this is, I have a process running already. This is this special over here. And now I can do S trace P process ID. N ah. On my distribution, typically this doesn't happen, but I know from Debian, Ubuntu and others that you are not allowed to trace your other processes which are not in your process group and which have been executed from the terminal security features, which is quite annoying if you want to trace something. As root you can do, so I could do now sudo, whatever. Uh, but if you do that a lot of times and you don't want to always do that as root, there's this magic command here in proxies kernel, something you can check what your current security scope is. There's a main page for that and it's... Is it actually in the s -trace? I don't know. And you just uh, select this command, please. Yeah, re reading is fine as a normal user, of course, uh, but if you, uh, right now, this is in state one. 
And so if I want to trace all my own processes, uh, which belong to my regular user, then you have to do that once. And if I try the S-trace again, now I'm allowed to do that. And so now it's connecting there and says, oh, I, I'm in p-select, whatever that exactly is. And if I now start typing here and type an H, and you see now the p-select returns that, ah, there was an input, and now it can read a character. That don't look at all, all the parameters. If you're only interested in data, it doesn't matter how p-select and select and poll and these things work. Then it just notifies you can read something, you can write something, and then see, yeah, this is the read, this is the write. And now if I type, you get for every character something. If I press enter, a lot of things happen because then it tries to execute the hello command, which does not exist, and it gives a lot of output, and then it's waiting again. So this is the easiest, easiest oh no, let's trace again. If I do that, hmm. And there's a lot of things which I'm not interested in. So we do that in a minute. Heading back to the slide. So this either call it with uh, S trace or attached to it. The second part is um, how do you control the output of S-trace because it's very important for the usability, I think. Uh, the easy way, and I always start with that, it's just get the S-trace output on the console itself. Uh, then you see what's going on. Also, you want to figure out, either just get an idea what the process is doing at all, just S-trace dash P, what, what, what is happening? Is it doing anything? Are there a lot of kernel calls? And if you then want to do an analysis, then you can go more fine grain and do thing, uh, write things to output files. Then, but then you don't see interactively how it's working. You can do a tail dash f on that file that you see what's going on. It always it depends a little bit what exactly you're interested in and how you start looking. Typically, I first do a S trace tool. Then on the next slide, I will show how I select to dedicated. Uh, system calls, and I choose all my options, which timing, uh, time stamps I want to have. And when everything is clear, then I do the tracing or tool starting again with all the gory details and op options, and then I put it to an output file. And then, yeah, the output file I can do with uh, follow all processes, and um, a lot of these options, uh, no, some of the options of S-Trace can be multiple times, one, two, three times, I think no more than three times, and they do different things. So here, it just uh, follow all the ch childs and put everything in the output file. If you do that dash F twice, no matter if you do that separately, or you could, I always save dashes, save all characters and recycle them if possible. Um, the dash 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 FF, just do it twice, which means that you don't get an output file, but you get output dot process ID for every single process. Um, We'll do that also. There are advantages and disadvantages depending on how you want to analyze that and what you're interested in. So let's try that all. What I claim here. So uh, I want to hear the dash F first for following. Ah, uh, no. Ah, this is on the next slide. Okay. But with dash E, to, to make things a little bit, I can say I only want to see read and write system calls, for example, because otherwise we are just spammed with a lot of things. Then it's easier to see what I'm typing. So this is the hello, read a character, write a character. And if I press enter, you only see that it's writing to a standard error. Oh, there was an error, nothing else happened. Now if you do the, in, ah, oh, no. One step back, so just return. If I do echo, hello, and press enter, we see the string hello from echo and it returns and does my prompt. Also understand, right? it's just the echo is executed. If I do hmm, backslash echo. Oh, I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, just shout up. Uh, I will not look for hands. If anything is very unclear, maybe I can explain immediately because we are running out of time anyway. If I do this. Oh, okay. Just jump in. Yeah. Uh, so someone online on Bean is asking, uh, is it possible to get the file name uh, through FD and write FD with S-trace? Uh, the simple answer is yes. Uh, the second answer is uh, look up in the file. I also only um, learned that two days ago when I was looking at the main page. Maybe I will show an example later. Okay. Um, 
Oh, it's doing still echo. If I do bin echo uh, and don't do any typos, and I press enter, there is no output anymore of the hello. Uh, what happened before is echo is an internal bash command, so it can execute the thing and write hello to standard output in terminal, and S trace sees it because it's tracing the bash and all the internal things which bash is doing internally. The backslash, I thought, uh, might also influence not going to the internal commandos. It's not. So it's only disabling allies and things like that. But uh, because I'm also showing that type echo to know what, which types of echo we have. Echo is a shell built in or you have it in, in the path. And the second example was now if I run echo with an explicit path, it's not tracing that because I did not start S trace with the dash F. And I only see what the bash is doing. Uh, so if I have the full S trace, then I would see um, the clone. So, oh, I'm starting a new process. This is what S trace will output, but I don't see what the new process is doing. I don't see that it's exec something, write something. If I want to do, see that, oops, then this is where the first time where the dash F option comes in. And now I can do the same bin echo. And now I see. This is from the prompt and what the command line is doing, but then somehow I should see this is the write from the new processes ID, and if I do it a second time, there's a second write from, again, another process ID where all the other things have been hidden uh, because I just trace only read and write outputs, and here you can see it's reading again libc and whatever, and you can focus, even tell strace to uh, go only for file descriptor number one, but this has other side effects which I don't like. The other options to getting these things selected because I'm a command line guy and uh, crap was invented 50 years ago. You always can do, for example, I know I only want to see right opening brace or opening brace is also a magic character. It's much easier doing it like this. If I do it, so filtering and using command line on S trace output is quite common to me. And then I see it's a new process. It's always writing boring. Okay, I, if I'm not interested in keeping that, but I want to have the file and date things, then I can start with output files. Typically, uh, time is short. Uh, my output files are always code O output file, O1, O2, O3. If I do now this on the same example, then it only tells me how I'm, I'm controlling several processes, things like that. And if I stop S trace again with control C, now to it first, then I got a small, very small output file. And it's more or less the same output I had on the terminal. This can be nice, and what I also can do is now using that two times dash F option, so follow the child's, but give me for every process separate output file. Doing this three times now, and looking which output files I got. This is the first one. I got four. Ah, the first output file is for the shell itself, and these are for the three echo things. Why this can be useful, you will see in a few minutes when I come to the timing options, or oh, time is a topic for this talk, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's on the slide. Uh, I need that only for... Um, I mean, yeah, if I type sudo and it prompts yes. for the password in terminal, will this monitor also that what goes through there? Yes. Okay. Uh, no. Ah, okay. Uh, now, now I got your question. If I would S trace sudo whatever, did I, did I get it right? If I do S trace sudo. If you, if you S trace that terminal and in the terminal somebody now, types sudo. Uh, now, now sudo is still. Uh, oh, it was different in the early days. Um, the point is uh, the sudo is a set UID script and it's switching to sudo. If you're not in sudo mode, uh, let's try me without the trace. I, I thought maybe I still have the password. Oh, it's okay. It's, then it was working. It's Did I get the right output? What typically happens if I... Uh, I think my idea was if you could use this so to spy I, passwords. And if I would do the trace on the sudo ID, something asking for the password, it's not doing that anymore uh, because it's set UID root and you cannot, as a regular user, trace, debug, whatever set UID root programs. That was a habit 
30 years ago and uh, it was a nice hacker attack to send systems. Oh, I can debug that and just change it. And they learned that it's not a good idea that the regular users can debug and trace to things that's not allowed and so that way. Yeah, but you see the password, if I do SSH somewhere and being asked for a password, it's in your log file. So be very careful, read the articles, be very careful if you keep log files around when, when you trace things. Um, you also can see that S-Trace is opening your local um, private key files if it's trying to connect to a remote machine. A lot of things which can be sensitive and you read your own files. So log files have sensitive data in many means if you do that on user processes. No, but back to the real topics today. Um, shaping of output. Uh, there are yeah, mostly two or three important things. You can change the, S tra uh, the string size if you do S trace cut ADC pass W, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see the things really. Def null. Then you would see, ah, I'm reading something from, from the password file. It's trying to read up to 128K. It got 5,800 whatever bytes, but you don't see them all. Uh, S-Trace is limiting strings uh, out that the output is more readable. It's also doing that for file name, path name. So if you even if you just trace um, which files are being opened if I run my favorite edit or whatever, because one of my very favorite things is um, I want to figure out which config files are used by tool beep and then all this, the path names are chopped. And this is quite bad. And if you want to see the full content, the full file names, it's always good giving some larger strings, depending on what you're doing. Triple nine is good sometimes, as you have seen, it, this allows um, 128 kilobytes in a single read, and you want to see the real 128 kilobyte in the read call in the s -trace output. Just give a few more nines, and if you do that, and then you can see here, blah, 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 blah. Um, it starts somewhere up. This is the read call on file descriptor 3, reading a lot of bytes, and somehow it said, yeah, I, I tried to read many bytes, but it's the last entry in the password file, and then, surprise, it does a write call with exactly the same data. So, increasing the string size is always the first thing I do, and the second one, which might be interesting, quite a number of system calls provide additional information. And for that, dash V, being more verbose can be quite interesting. Let's do it like this. I don't want to get, then you get a lot of things about the, no, not, not get the file descriptors, this will be the ne next option. Uh, how can I show that if I see the XL? Why, um, where, where it's mostly useful for me just on the exec command itself. Uh, the exec command before we have seen it's calling bin PW or bin echo or whatever. And it's the parameter which is on the command line. If I only do echo, it will not give the full path. But then you get the full environment, for example. And uh, also the full environment can be chopped out. There's a lot of dot, 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 because those environment variables are a little bit too short. So then again, as I want to see the full environment. And this is then a nice thing if you trace a full bash script and whatever, and have a lot of XX, you can see all the details, how the path looked like and whatever. And and a lot of other things, the I.O. control you see, which I.O. control things are being done, and other options for that. Oops, there's a creep. Five minutes, that's very bad. Um, <laughs> just to show um, that there is an option X, we don't need that anymore. Uh, giving the str strings in hex output, I was looking for that for a while. Um, that only printing um, hex output backslash x whatever uh, for strings or byte sequences which are unprintable um, but still my write and read and things are all readable and if you double that then everything is being in hex can be quite useful for non-printed char characters if you're quoting if you want to reuse that output I mean, let's read the slides oh god um, so giving hex output s99 now it's about what I just thought a little bit, um, uh, selecting what I'm interested in. So typically, what I try to show for the timing, just reading and writing, for example, from a serial device and see one data come in. You can say, I'm interested in all the open calls. Long time, it was just easy saying, 
minus E open, or you can do that with comma, have a lot of these things. Um, these days, if you do S trace the open calls, typically you don't see anything because most of the time it's now open 64 and whatever. And if you don't know, and in stat is even more difficult because you have the stat, stat 64 and stat whatever. And long time ago, this is what I learned in a talk from Dimitri in Fostem. Um, he made regular expressions. You can say slash open and any call with open, if there's a, don't know, socket open, it would also trace that one uh, with uh, trace all the, whatever is calling stat. So th this is quite useful for me if uh, I want to have things e slash stat on, don't know how much, uh, it's a new fs stat. Not what I was looking for, but if I can do the ls, for example, we see, see some stat uh, ls dash l. It has to do a stat on the files, and you can see stat x not to get all the file attributes. And you will see some of those things that um, are still, uh, you get more information about file attributes and everything. If you do the dash v now, a single file attribute is giving more, all the bits and bytes are now in ASCII version, if possible. That's quite useful. The most common use for me is dash e file. Uh, give me all file operations, all file access, all system calls which have file names. Reading, writing, no, sorry, not read, but opening, cop moving, things like that. So if you're interested in what does this process, that script do with any type of file which is trying to access, you also see which files are not existing. This is very helpful. So typically I use that if I try to figure out where a tool, where I don't have docs are actually lazy, where's the config file? Because you will see an open or access attempt to a file, file name which you have not on your machine and then, ah, then I can figure out what to write in there. Timing. This is now what I planned to talk about. <laughs> Um, there's, uh, there's only three options, it's quite easy. That's upper, lowercase t, uppercase t, and r. And let's do that. S trace t gives you a timestamp for every system call. Um, by default, it's not too exciting. It's, it just gives hours, minutes, seconds. And if you run that for a long time, you don't even know which day it was. Um, and as the slide already say, you can double that. Uh, since before it was all the same second, so it's uh, on a very coarse scale with double T, you get uh, at least the seconds in microseconds. And what very often I use is triple T. Then you get uh, seconds since uh, Unix time in, in front uh, with microsecond resolution. That's quite useful since uh, really the Unix seconds since 1970. You have an absolute time. You can compare that also with other timestamps from other tools in your computer. Uh, I'm just on a quest uh, where uh, something like a web interface or the embedded controller doesn't work anymore. And uh, then you can compare the, uh, merge these timestamps with TCP timestamps. And uh, if you have all computer connected to network time synchronization, then you even can go for uh, comparing that with the remote host and share that, merge that in. You just have to sort all the files and you get uh, where it comes from. Um, in the old time, the dash R, that's relative timestamps. It can be quite useful. We have to extend that, sorry. Um, then you get just relative timestamps to the last call. Now in that thing, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and in the old S trace version, it was not possible to trace both absolute and relative time. And I was very surprised preparing the talk to see if you now combine those, it's possible to see absolute time and the relative time. And even uh, uppercase T always was possible. Um, nothing happened here. You get this timestamp is when the call, because it really prints from left to right. When the kernel is called and astray is notes are we're calling close. This is timestamp when the call starts. And in the very back, the uppercase T gives you how many microseconds the system spent in the kernel, plus minus a lot of overhead for all these S-tracing things. So um, this is not too exciting for these examples, but a little bit, no, I have to show that. This is why I brought these wonderful embedded devices to have some real sensor data and dev, dev TDY is just at least one. So, uh, okay, this is the wonderful white thing which I got yesterday evening. It's an ESP32 running RISC-V Rust binary from the wonderful uh, fearless Rust whatever. And I noticed it's really taking only very many, 
I haven't, I haven't seen that stop sign. Uh, and caps lock is fighting against me. Uh, SJ is. Uh, uh, oh. Do just relative timestamps, for example. And then you can see. Blub, blub, blub. One of the timestamps. Oh, the green thing is because, yeah, the output of that thing is green. And we don't like the output of what's coming out here. Def null. And then we see it takes 1.7 second from the read. It's wait, uh, between read and write because it's taking a while and we can also do the uppercase T. Uh, I have plenty of time. It's your lunch time. I will start talking until we switch off power supply and the light. It happened in one conference one time because that you, what's going on? Well, now, now it's getting interesting things here. Yeah? Uh, you can uh, figure out uh, what, what, what you can see here is, for example, it's staying 1.7 seconds in the, in the read call waiting, give me data from the zero interface. So if you want to know when the data really comes, you should do absolute timestamp plus that. Use your favorite scripting language, whatever. I don't know an option where I can get here an absolute timestamp. It's always, I state that sometimes. Uh, one of the gadgets is a GPS receiver and you really can do, that's, uh, don't know which one. ACM zero or one, don't know. This is uh, the temperature sensor, uh, acceleration sensor, then th this will be the temper uh, GPS thing. And the GPS will provide timing data in G if it's for, it doesn't have any data. Uh, so no, it's not receiving any satellites here. That's a bit pity uh, because I just, because then you would be able to see if your clock is very well synchronized. You either can check the timing of your external things and see with your computer clock uh, in, if you would have seen any satellites, I would see at least the day of time here, but it's not doing that. And what we can do for the other sensors. And now if you start, I have to look at the thing again, cut. Oh, this satellite again, ACM-1. <laughs> so this is very simply giving a single line of some acceleration sensor thing. Yeah. It's doing reading and writing, providing that once per second, it was configured doing once per second. You see, it's not once per second, but every 0 0.64 seconds. And then you, shall we stop? Yeah, yeah, we'll stop. It's uh, just you, you have questions. Yeah, they, I, I'm still here. Uh, I won't run away. Um, just a um, little command of uh, fun of the last slide. Replay, replaying process is also what's possible with um, s -trace since what I, So it's not only looking like C code for the kernel call. You really can um, take, get me back to my shell command. So that hello things, hello. Oops. So that Right, hello, something. Can you see it? I can't. Oh, wh why do I do it with time? So, this is really real C code, except for, oh, we are returning something, and what you can do is cut right that in. I've prepared that, hello. I wanted to time it, but hello.c. If you just take this single line, remove the, oh, we're we returning 13 byte and make a semicolon. And uh, do main and whatever, and say make hello, compile it. I think even that is prepared. Then you execute exactly that kernel call. And if you do the same now with a larger example, um, you get all the writes and s traces and whatever. And then you can do something like PLS trace, oh, this one, for example. This is the s trace of PDF LaTeX running exactly my. Uh, my PDF slides for that talk, and I'm not really so sure how this is now going to. Oh, shit. PL.C. Not sure. Uh, and you can just include <laughs> something like that. Just do, do the whole write things, uh, remove everything at the end of PL. No. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, there's one line with an equal whatever. Oh, it's only the S trace. PDF. How is it really called? Something with P. 
C and C2. C2, let me take C2. And yeah, uh, I wrote a small, uh, if you do the relative time stamps, you can say, who sleeps this relative time stamp in microseconds? I thought that I have an example without it, you sleep. If you do it all together, and I hope I didn't mess up too much, now I have to do that back, and make PL. And you now can run this program. It's always doing a U-sleep from that relative timestamp and doing the write and doing the U-sleep and the write. And this is exactly more or less in real time plus minus a little bit of overhead uh, that you can see uh, doing that. And long time ago, I was doing that for fun for colleagues in my old company because they, yeah, they looked for s some opportunity having an hour or multi-hour compile. Just keep it running and look like compiling that your machine is busy while you're not sucking up CPU time. But you also really can do in real time what you trace, have the same time pattern again. And I had once a use case where with a specific time pattern things happened and with other specific time patterns it did not happen. If you run a tool multiple times, you realize, oh, something there's something going wrong on a remote server thing. Then you can look up all the timestamps and whatever and replay more or less the same thing and doing nice test cases also with that one. Lots of options. I'm very sorry that this didn't work out better. I think I have to write a second paper about all the timing fun. How you do these things, how you do timing analysis now, how good your clock in the embedded device is. If you have the GPS receiver with very precise timestamps coming in, you can see how good your clock is in here. In both cases, you will see uh, that you have a temperature drift, uh, especially for the embedded things. It's getting warmer and the clock is, even if it's a quartz, uh, it's not really good. And tons of interesting things just playing around with time as a physicist. And so, sorry for taking too long for the introduction. Feel uh, <laughs> free to come forward uh, and if, ask for questions and I'll stay around. And, <laughs>